Watch your <laughs> okay, so uh, let's get started with the rest of our morning session. Uh, we'll continue with the third lecture from Thanks. So <clears throat> what I want to start with is um, returning to um, Abelianchur and Simon's theory, which we discussed towards the end of um, my second lecture, which was on Tuesday. So we're going to consider the action that I wrote down then okay um, these um, multi uh, so so here I is assumed to run from one to n, okay, and um, so this is uh, an extra index, not to, not having nothing to do with the spatial indices mu, or space time indices mu is running over zero, one, two. This is space and time, okay, um, and these multi churn simons theories were first introduced, I think, in the context of the quantum Hall effect by uh, Nick. And also by Wen and Z in the early 90s. Um, and building on earlier work of um, Nick and also Zhang, Hansen, and Kivelson on just the one component version of this. Okay. We uh, encountered on Tuesday one particular example of this, which is the example that's relevant to the Torah code. But I want to discuss this a little bit more generally now. Okay. In order to do that, okay, I want to make a uh, introduce a little bit of um, I want to massage this into a form in which it's a little bit easier to use and talk about in more generality. Um, this matrix K is a non-degenerate. It's assumed to be a non-degenerate. Symmetric integer matrix. Okay, we already saw one example. Okay, so we saw the example for the Torah code was two by two off diagonal matrix with twos off diagonal. Um, another example, which I may have mentioned um, on Tuesday, is if we consider just, let's say, the Laughlin state at nu equals one third, okay, then it's a one by one matrix, which is just the number three. Okay. But I want to now consider such theories more generally. Okay. In order to do that, it's convenient to uh, rewrite this matrix K in a slightly different form. So let's first consider its eigenvectors. Okay, it's non-degenerate and symmetric, so we can find eigenvectors for this. So let's call the eigenvectors the eighth eigenvector has eigenvector lambda a. So this is the eighth. eigenvector, we'll call it EIA, and the eighth eigenvalue is lambda A. Okay. Now, we can normalize the eigenvectors. So, first of all, EIA, E. We can normalize this so that their norms, 
If A and B are different, this should vanish. If they have different eigenvalues, it has to vanish. If they have the same eigenvalues, we can just, if they have, we have two eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue, we can just find two orthonormal, or two normal, we can diagonalize within that to find two normal eigenvectors. Orthogonal, sorry, orthogonal. Yes, I didn't mean, no, yeah, sorry. I meant, or, thank you, orthogonal. I didn't mean orthonormal, though. I meant orthogonal. I don't want them to be orthonormal. I actually want to normalize them by the eigenvalues so that this is proportional to delta AB, but not equal to delta AB, but in instead equal to the absolute value of the eigenvalue. Okay. The reason that this is convenient is that now allows us to write Kij as the inner product over these eigenvectors. Another way of saying it is that if you take the matrix whose rows are the eigenvectors, then the, or sorry, whose columns are the eigenvectors, then that matrix diagonalizes a symmetric um, non-degenerate matrix. Okay, And this eta is then diagonal matrix that's ones and minus ones on the diagonal according to whether those eigenvalues are positive or negative. So if we just had a positive definite matrix so that all the eigenvalues were positive, then we would just say K would be the Euclidean inner product between the rows of the matrix whose, uh, which diagonalizes the matrix K. Okay? But more generally, since K is not assumed to be positive definite here, and for instance in this case it's not positive definite, it has one positive and one negative eigenvalue. So it's a mixed sign metric over here. Okay. Well, no, I have two upper indices here and two lower indices here, so it's OK. No. Was I not so consistent here? Oh, oh yeah, oh, over here. Thank you. Yeah, actually, you're right. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that line's fine. The line here. No, I think it's okay. So the, the 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 indefinite metric is only for these lower case indices A and B. I and J doesn't have any such metric, so it's okay. Yeah. Correct. These E's are not integers. I mean, they almost certainly won't be integers. Correct. Um, good. Now, uh, so what this allows us to do, it allows us to trade in our matrix K for a lattice lambda, which is given by integer combination, integer linear combinations. of these vectors e. Okay. So I'm going to I introduced this metric eta and I had little indices over here. I'm not going to suppress those indices and use a vector notation over here. So if you wish, we can think of we can define this vector eia as or ei vector as let this sit inside of R and plus and minus where capital N is N plus and N minus number of positive eigenvalues and this is the number of negative eigenvalues. So we're now thinking of these vectors E as living in n-dimensional Euclidean space or n-dimensional space of with a metric of signature n plus comma n minus. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, like, 
Yes, because because it allows me to write this equation, which uh, which which another way of saying that is that k by j is the Gram matrix of this lattice. So in other ways, uh, um, you could perfectly well could do it the way you suggested. The reason I prefer to do it this way is. Um, is just that it's a little easier for me to remember a simple metric, and then and then and then these lattice vectors end up looking complicated. Like Charlie said, they're not integers or anything like that. You could just as well, as you said, put the lambdas in the other place, and then you would just say, okay, look, I just have to remember that my inner product has lambdas on the diagonal. That's all. So it's perfect. It's I mean, what you say is right, and one is absolutely. Uh, entitled to do it that way. Nothing will change as long as everywhere you see some inner product, you just have to remember that inner product is with respect to some metric that has lambda sitting on the diagonal. But, perf but perfectly okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, it, it, I, would, I wouldn't say it's I'm trying to decouple these particles. Well, it'll be clear what I'm trying to do, I think, I hope, soon. But I, I'm just trying to get a nice, compact notation that will allow me to summarize the topological properties of this theory. Well... Um, not exactly. I mean, the EI, I mean, um, the EIs are not orthogonal, right? Because EI, so KIJ is the gram matrix of the lattice lambda, which is equal to EI inner product EJ. So, so these things aren't orthogonal. And even though I'm going to multiply them by the A's, it doesn't give me something orthogonal. But, I mean, you'll see what I'm going to use this for soon, I, I hope. Okay. Um, now we can actually do the same thing with the inverse matrix. Okay, we can go to its. Sorry, for the purists out there, I guess I should put the put upper indices over here. Um, so these are its eigenvec. Or these, I should say, uh, these are not the eigenvectors of K. These are the columns of the matrix whose rows are eigenvectors. OK. Um, so Kij, K inverse Ij is Fi. Dot fj. Okay. We can similarly define a lattice by these, and that lattice is in fact the dual lattice to the original lattice. Okay. The reason it's a dual lattice is because k times k inverse is the identity matrix. So that tells you that, in fact, the inner products between the f's and e's are all zeros and ones. Okay. Now, we're also here, I should say, free to perform transformations, w, k, or I should say, where this W is in GLN Z. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matrix of integers that's invertible, OK? Uh, therefore, has determinant plus or minus 1. Such a, such a transformation, OK, is if you think about what it does in terms of here, is a change 
of basis of the lattice lambda. Okay. So the k's. So two k's may not represent different theories. Okay. Even if they naively appear distinct, because one is free to make a change of basis of this form. That change of basis, which is a general linear transformation over the integers on the k matrix, it's just a change of basis of the lambdas. So once we've defined a lattice in this way, we're of course free to pick a different basis. Okay? And those basis changes are exactly these kinds of transformations. Yes. Okay, I'm going to now. I'm, so I haven't compute. So th these are all mathematical statements. I haven't computed anything yet. No, none of the topological properties of this. But that's what I'm about to do right now. Okay. So let's consider. Okay, what happens when we take? Well, let's 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 imagine now braiding particles. So. Um, Okay, so we want to braid two particles, and how are we going to specify our particles? Okay, our particles have to be given by some charges over these fields over here. Okay, so um, in particular, what the turn side, the a zero i equation of motion of this theory says. This is the A0 I equation of motion. It says that if you take the curl of the jth gauge field in this theory, that it's, oh, sorry, this is times 2 pi. Okay. So by vary, excuse me, varying um, that action with respect to AI, we get, or I guess AJ technically, but. Um, you get an equation of motion like this. It says the magnetic flux, or the fictitious magnetic flux in the ith gauge field, okay, is given by the charges of all these different species multiplied by this in this inverse matrix, okay, in units of two pi, which is the flux quantum. Okay, so if we have to create particle hole pairs of charged particles, okay, and we specify them by two different integer vectors, okay? So this vector ni says how, what charge under the first gauge field, what charge in the second gauge field, what charge in the third gauge field, and so on, a given particle has, okay? Um, and this one says what charges the particle has under, uh, these, these particles have under those gauge fields. Then because each sees the, the, the flux of the others, the phase that's acquired here is equal to e to the 2 pi i k inverse ij and j. So it just says, you just have to see what types of, types of charges the particles have, and if you want to know the phase you acquire when you take one around the other, you just multiply those together with, if you wish, the multiplication rule has to sit at the inverse matrix K inverse inside here. Okay. Yes? And those charges have to be integers. Correct. Well, no, that, that's the way we've, the whole theory has been normalized in that way. So the, with the charges integers and the k's integers over here. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Now, you can see this phase, I can rewrite in a slightly different notation.
Yeah. Where? Uh, these? On the middle board. Yeah, no. these No, sorry. They don't. They don't. This is just a this is just an integer. This is just a integer vector. They both happen to be integer vectors. This is an integer vector that specifies the charges that I'm creating here. Right. I'm just saying another way of saying it is this actually I could I could make that a little more explicit. So I could say J zero j okay is equal to a sum of well i could just say j zero j is equal to mj there's some integer and then i'm going to give it a delta function x minus x of tau so i'm just saying i have a delta function source moving along some prescribed trajectory given over here and the, and the strength of that charge is some integer mj. Okay. And what I'm writing down for you here is what's the phase that's acquired when I exchange, when I take one of these charges around another. Okay. And it's this phase over here in terms of the charges under the different gauge fields that are carried. Now, the point I'm making on the last line is that I can rewrite this as the inner product between two vectors, v and v prime, where v is and v prime are just those, those integer vectors multiplied by basis vectors in the dual lattice. That takes care of this factor of k inverse. So these v and v prime live inside the dual lattice. So an equally good way, so the, the, maybe the simplest or most um, apparent way to think about the, char the different particles you have in this theory is you'd say, well, I'll just take some integer vector. And that integer vector, for instance, if it were the Laughlin state, where the integer vector is going to be one, you know, these are going to be one, one component vectors, that integer might be 0, 1, or 2, corresponding to the vacuum state, the e over 3, or the charge e over 3, 2e over 3 particle. Similarly, in, the, in, in, in a more complicated state, you'd pick some integer vector, say what all the charges are under the different gauge fields. What I'm saying here is, we can just as well think of these Rather than thinking of these as integer vectors, we can think of them as vectors living in the dual lattice here. And the dual lattice is the lattice of, well, it's almost, for reasons that I'm about to explain, it's almost basically the lattice of all the different particle types in the theory. Okay. Because this is a completely general statement here that I braid particles of these two types carrying these charges. This is arbitrary. So this is an arbitrary particle in the theory. And the result you get is, is this. Okay. So you can think of particles in the theory as vectors in the dual lattice. Yes? That's right. That's not, I mean, you can, you can certainly see that this matrix here, it's a symmetric matrix, is, what, is where that sanity check is coming in. And you get a very symmetrical looking expression in the end. No. This doesn't say what the particle constant is. What set of M and M do you about? Correct. That's right. That's right. So far, I have not said that. Yeah, but uh, that's some fraction of that lattice or the whole lattice. Exactly. So, and that's you no. Know, that's a very good question, and that's exactly the. That's exactly what we're going to talk about next. So, so what this tells us is, under braiding, we get an expression like this. Now, notice that if we were to take v and we were to replace v by itself plus any vector lambda that lives in the original lattice, okay, then this expression. Okay, so let's say we replace v by another vector that's been shifted by, by the same vector shifted by some element of the lattice. Well, lambda dot v prime has to be an integer because that's the definition of the dual lattice. Any vector in the lattice in a product with a vector in the dual lattice has to be an integer. 
So this is, in fact, equal to equal to this. Okay. So in fact, two particles, so what this is telling us is that as far as braiding is concerned, if you have any vector in the dual lattice, it's just as good as far as braiding is concerned with any other vector that, that you obtain from it by shifting by a vector in the original lattice. Okay. Or another way of saying that more generally is that rather than considering all the vectors in the dual lattice, we should actually take, we should mod out by all the vectors in the original lattice. Okay. So let me rewrite that over here. Okay, so the topologically distinct particle types okay, are given by the coset of the dual lattice by the original lattice. Okay, so recall. Since this is an integer lattice, the, the original lattice is an integer lattice. If you take its coset, the lambda is a sub lattice of the dual lattice. So if you take the dual lattice, you mod out, you'll get a finite lattice. Okay. Sorry, you get a finite group, I should say. What's that? Um, oh. Lambda star are all of the vectors whose inner products with the vectors in lambda are integers. And the vectors in lambda certainly are also vectors whose vectors are inter integers. Because remember, the inner, all, all those inner products are given by Kij, which is an integer matrix. So the ultimate reason is because Kij is an integer matrix. Okay. Right. So, so this, is, um, a f this is a finite set. In fact, it's a finite abelian group because we can think of the lattice as an infinite abelian group and it's dual also. And we're taking the coset of two infinite abelian groups and getting a finite group, abelian group. So this is a finite abelian group, usually called the discriminant group. We can obtain the number of elements from the discriminant group simply by asking, well, how many vectors in the dual lattice are there sitting inside of the unit cell of the original lattice? Okay. But the, and that we can determine by just considering the relative volumes of the, um, of the unit cell of the dual lattice and the original lattice. But since we know the Gram matrix, which is the matrix of inner products of the basis vectors, So this is volume of the unit cell of, la of lambda star over the unit cell of lambda, which is just determinant of k to the 1 half over determinant of k inverse to the 1 half, or simply determinant of k. So it's a it's a finite abelian group, and the number of elements in that abelian group is, a, is the absolute value of the determinant of k. Yes, thanks. Okay. Yes. Um, I mean, one way to think about it is you're taking a Jacobian 
for a change of variables, which is the square to the determinant. From, yeah. I mean, basically, it's, it's from, a, from a hypercubic lattice into some other lattice. It's another way of saying it. Yeah. Like when you get square root of the metric. Yeah. 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 That's right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll just repeat, since I'm on the mic, I'll just repeat what Nick said, which is that the grand matrix is already something quadratic. Um, good. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, so we can actually summarize what we just said about braiding over here by, or it's customary to define a matrix. Uh, so I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation then. So whereas I was previously introduced, I'm going to put a square bracket around a vector, which is going to be the equivalence class of a vector v in the dual matrix. Oh, sorry, in the dual lattice. So that means it's v and everything you can get from v by shifting by vectors in the original lattice lambda. Okay. So I'll just put square brackets around vectors. I may sometimes forget, so please feel free to, to remind me. So it's customary to summarize what we just wrote down about braiding over there by defining a matrix S. OK, it's a matrix whose rows and columns are, um, per, are, are, are denoted by the particle types and given by its elements are e to the 2 pi i v, time, v dot v prime. So this factor here is put here just to make this matrix unitary. Okay. You can see it's very much like a Fourier transform, a finite Fourier transform. Okay. And it summarizes sort of what we said over there. In fact, if you think about what this is, this is this is basically the square of what we, in our matrix notation, would have called R V, V prime, V plus V prime. Okay. But with an extra normalization factor so that this thing viewed as a matrix is a unitary matrix. Okay. Now we can also you know, just using the facts over here about what flux is attached to a particle, also compute the twists. Those are also conventionally put into a matrix, which is a diagonal matrix. So it's just delta V, V prime. e to the pi i v squared. And then it's customary to put an extra factor over here for reasons that I will explain momentarily. Okay, So these are, this is the what we normally call the twist. So if you have a vector in the dual lattice, or an equivalence class, or an element in the discriminant group, okay, then for any element of the discriminant group, it should have a twist. And recall, so if we have particle type V, you put a twist in it, you're supposed to pick up a phase factor. That phase factor theta is given by this. Okay, and these phase fact, these twist factors are organized into a diagonal matrix T. Okay, so that's what the delta over here tells the diagonal matrix. It's got these twists. It has an extra 
overall phase, it doesn't depend on the particle type, which is there for reasons that I'll explain momentarily. But this, these two matrices, S and T, encode the, all the braiding properties, since the S is basically R squared. It's what happens when you take one particle around another, and the T's have all the twists. Okay, any questions? Yes. What's that? So as of right now, so I haven't introduced that term yet, so, but for, um, for the experts, so thus far D is just the discriminant group. It's the finite abelian group you get by, take, by modding out the dual lattice by the original lattice. And the cardinality of that, which of, that I'm putting the bars around, is equal to the number of particle types. And this theory being an abelian theory, the number of particle types is the quantum dimension, since all the, all the individual particles have quantum dimension one. If that last sentence didn't make sense to you, don't worry. I'm going to explain that later in the lecture. But in case some of you who know about quantum dimensions are wondering, yes, this is a quantum dimension. Correct. Okay. Right. Excuse me? Total quantum dimension, right, that's right, the total quantum dimension of the theory. Any other questions? <laughs> or I haven't discussed even or odd yet, okay? But I'm going, I'm going to, I didn't, so far I have not, I've allowed, I, I mean, one of these examples is an odd lattice, yeah. So I haven't discussed that yet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, so N plus and N minus, the K matrix has N plus positive and N minus negative eigenvalues. Okay. What's that? Are the generators of D anything special? Um, um, not really. I mean, I, I will introduce a way of thinking about D that kind of decomposes it in a useful way, but um, I mean, I would say not, not, I mean, the answer is not really. Yeah. yeah, right, yeah. And they're not unique, right? I mean, that's, that's probably the best reason why they're not, there's nothing special since it's not really a unique choice. Um, okay. Now, um, Good. So, so uh, maybe it's a, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I've defined a matrix. So the rows and columns are labeled by the different particle types, which is, so it's a finite number of rows and columns given by the number of elements in D. The elements of the matrix are V and, uh, are, are these uh, exponentials of inner products. Um, a normalization factor was put in just to make it a unitary matrix. Um, a homework problem, check that it's unitary. Okay. Although that's not a very difficult homework problem, but but in the interest of time, I won't, I won't do it for right now, and I'll leave it as a homework problem. But, um, I mean, I haven't really explained to you why I want to arrange these things into a matrix. I mean, in fact, you might even say it seems a little unnatural given that, well, it more or less looks like the, the elements look like the squares of elements of the R symbols. So, um, so we certainly could leave it as... Uh, we, we certainly don't have to write down S and can leave it in terms of R's, um, but, I, but, I, but I want to first explain why this is true, and then I'll explain why it's useful to put, put, um, put them into a matrix. Okay. Um, where's Victor? Oh, yeah. So in answer to, oh, okay, but partially in answer to your question, Victor, from the beginning, why should we ever think about these lattices or anything like that? Um, one answer is, uh, you have some K matrix, and you'd like to really know what the particles of the theory are. One simple, one simple way, and I'll explain why this is this is a simple way to think about it, is that the particles of the theory sit in some finite abelian group. 
Okay, and that finite abelian group is given by this coset over here. Okay, um, and the power of it being a finite abelian group is that also, in fact, tells you for, we knew, we want to know what the fusion uh, rules are for this theory. Well, the fusion rules are just the group multiplication rule over here. So if you if you recall, in the case of the toric code, we we noted that the toric code the fusion rules were actually, the fusion algebra was in fact a group, just a finite group. That generalizes, okay, to this case, to this situation here. But the fusion rules are just given by V and V, v and V prime, or the equivalence class of V and V prime, the fusion product is the equivalence class of V plus V prime. Okay, yes? Is it fair to say that all those relations are just one group without a uh, no, there's two more things we need to know besides D. Okay. okay. Which, which, we're, which we're, yeah, we're, we're headed there. Okay. What's that? Yeah, this is a billion. Oh, sorry, yeah, this is a billion. This is a billion. Correct. Strictly a billion. Okay. Okay, so um, so I want to introduce a couple more um, little number theoretic facts. So there's something called quadratic Gauss sum, okay, which is it's just a sum that Gauss discovered, okay, and so for any odd prime p. 1 over the square root of p, sum from n equals 0 to p minus 1, e to the 2 pi i, n squared over p, this is equal to okay. So I'm not going to prove this for you. You can convince yourself that this is true. And this was actually one like intermediate step on one of the proofs of quadratic reciprocity. So it's just an, a number theory fact about prime numbers. That if you take these sums, so if you take p, what this is saying, if you take p -th roots of unity, okay. So if you're taking numbers on the circle and you take e to the two pi i over p, if you take p -th roots of unity and then you take sums, or you take this to powers to squared powers, okay, then that sum is given by the right hand side. Okay. What's that? That's an eight over here, yeah. What's that? Yeah, the P P is an odd prime number. It means not two. <laughs> it means a prime number that's not two. Oh, yeah, I didn't mean strange prime numbers, right? Yeah, I doesn't mean strange. Uh, there, how's that? Primes p not equal to two. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So for, for this is this is not true in general, but this is true for prime numbers. Okay. And what it's really saying is. For you know, odd prime numbers are either congruent to one or three mod four, and if it's congruent to one mod four, you get one here, and if it's congruent to three mod four, you get i. Okay. It's, another way, it's another way of saying this. Okay. Now this generalizes, so this is, if you wish, we can think of this as kind of a trivial example of a lattice, so of a one D lattice. Or I should say of a discriminant group. Okay. This is this you can think of as the D equals Z P case. Okay. Where it's a cyclic group of prime order. It generalizes. Gauss Milgram sum.
Well, actually, I mean, Generalization of this formula, the higher dimensional generalization is you take any lattice, you sum over elements of the discriminant group, you take e to the 2 pi i times a notion of length. Sorry, let me write this a little bigger. The correct notion of length here is v squared over 2. Okay. If you take that sum, you get on the right hand side e to the 2 pi i at over, over 8. And the p minus 1 is replaced by the number of positive minus the number of negative eigenvalues, okay, or the signature of that lattice. Yes. So, you, so if I want to generalize this to an abelian finite group, Okay. Then what I need to do, so, uh, yeah, so let me come back to that momentarily. Okay. I mean, I was about to get to that later, so, but let me just let this formula sink in for just a moment. Okay. Okay. So this is something we can directly apply to this K matrix theory we've just been talking about. Okay. What we need is. So of course we have we have this discriminant group, we have a lattice, we have a notion of length of the lattice, we have we have everything we need here. Okay. And the reason that we put this factor over here, okay, was it enables us these well, well you, the two things you can see about the matrices we defined is that S squared equals one and S T cubed equals 1. You have to use this relation here to prove that st cubed equals 1. I mean, these are, these are after all, the diagonal elements of t. And if you see, this thing over here is this thing cubed. So I won't go through all the algebra, because it's a little bit of a, um, a digression. But by putting these seeming fudge factors into this matrix t, it allows us to write down S and T matrices that satisfy S squared equals 1 and ST cubed equals 1, which are, which is a presentation of the modular group of the torus. Okay. So, so this is related to, so we, we, we're talking on um, Monday and Tuesday about the mapping class group of these different surfaces. So if we consider the torus, there, the mapping class group is generated by the Dane twists and also by these modular transformations S that switch the meridian and longitude of the torus. And so this particular way of defining S and T is designed so as to give the defining relations modular group of the torus here. It'll be a little bit of a digression to go into this further, but I just wanted to make sure that you saw why we define things in this way. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, I didn't. Um, I mean, um, and I, I, I'm not really planning to, but I can tell you one way to think about them, which is if you put this theory on a, on a, on a disk, let's say, then the positive and negative eigenvalues tell you how many right-moving and left-moving modes you have on the edge. Okay. So that's kind of the physical thing to keep in mind. Um, in terms of the bulk theory, it's really sort of telling you about the handedness of the, of, 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 you know, well, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. So let me just leave it at that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Um, I've been told to end not too far 
late today because we started late. No, so so here's my plan. I'm going to try to, I'm not going to do that now. And then if I end early, I'll come back and do it. How's that? I mean, um, the T is not extremely surprising because after all, that's the day in twists is exactly what you sort of expect for twisting a particle around. The S is a little bit, uh, slightly more subtle. Um, let me come back to it. it, it time depend, you know, time permitting. Yeah. No. Yes. So the physical meaning here of the 8 and 24 is, if you know what this is saying, so uh, so far there is a generalization of this to non-abelian theories, which hopefully I'll get to today. But so far I've only done it for abelian theories. But what this is saying is knowing the, so this is telling us we know the bulk quasi-particle topological twists. And in fact, it's true more generally, knowing bulk quasi-particle properties only lets us determine this mod 8. Okay, so it means that you can have, in, in particular, what it means, well, so, so let's just say, let, let's just leave it at that. I mean, um, kind of coming back to Lucille's question, what I said, the answer is you can think of this as the number of right moving and number of left moving modes. The difference between the number of right and left moving modes at the edge is not uniquely determined by the bulk, it's only determined mod 8. Okay, and what this is saying is, is, is that the topological properties of the theory really only determine what's going on at the edge mod 24. So the bulk topological property. So there, there are some bulk topological properties beyond just the braiding properties of the particles, which is encoded in the modular transformation properties. There's a little bit more, and that's, that, only, that is only determines the edge mod 24. Yes. You know, I wish I knew. I mean, yeah, it's two, it, it, as far as I can tell, it's two different eights that arise for unrelated reasons. And it seems like a huge coincidence to me, but I can't see any direct relation. Yeah, so, I mean, I think what you're saying, oh, oh, I think, well, I don't know about the interacting, but uh, there's another famous eight, which is the eight of bot periodicity, which is for non-interacting which is a way of classifying non-interacting free fermion systems. And I don't know any connection between the 8 and bot periodicity in this 8. No. Mm. What's that? Because of well, this 8 you can think of as being because of E8. Right. Yeah. The bot periodicity eight, I don't, I don't see any relation to E eight there, right? So, okay, okay, maybe, okay. Uh, um, okay, maybe, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a geometric journal? Um, for the free fermion cases, there probably is, but um, I don't think that's particularly an enlightening way to think about this equation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, say it again? Can you get some modular anomalies, so. Yeah, oh, OK. Yeah, I guess so. so I mean, to the sense that this is a, this is a difference of central charges. Yeah. yeah. OK. So, um, so Nick asked uh, earlier an important question. What if you had a general abelian group? Well, actually, there is a generalization of this. What you need is. Finite abelian group D. Um, we need what's called a finite quadratic form Q, which is just some map from D to the rational numbers mod the integers. 
Okay? And by quadratic, we mean that it satisfies the property qn v equals n squared times v. So it's some map from this finite abelian group to the rational numbers mod the integers that satisfies this property. Okay? Okay, here I'm interpreting this finite abelian group as additive. Okay. What's that? Sorry, this is N. So Q of N V is N squared times V. Oh, sorry, thank you. That's a typo. Q of N V is N squared times Q of V. That's what it means to be quadratic in this context. So V is an element of a finite abelian group. I'm viewing the group as additive, okay? So I'm, I'm, well, I'm thinking of the multiplication rule as addition, since it's an abelian group, that's a natural thing to do. So if I take V and add V to itself, that's two, I'll call that 2V, and then Q of 2V is four times Q of V, and so on. Okay. Here n is an integer, correct? n is necessarily an integer. Okay. Formula has yes, the formula has the right hand side. It, it's oh yeah, that's right. Modular integers, correct? Right. Yeah. Oh, good. So I'm just saying. Look, we derived through all this K-matrix technology. What we ended up deriving is that, look, you have a number of particle types that's given by this D, OK? And in fact, what I'm doing is I'm answering your earlier question, basically, which is you said, well, is D everything you need to know for an abelian topological phase? And the answer is no. You need to know more than an abelian group. You need to know an abelian group, number one. You need to have a finite quadratic form, Q, which is just a map from that abelian group to the rational numbers mod integers that satisfies this quadratic property, OK? If you have those, you almost have a lift to a lattice lambda, OK? So that's a mathematical theorem that I won't prove for you. You need one more thing to guarantee that you have that lift, which I'll tell you. Given this, it's the case that sum on all elements in the finite group So some integer, so given a finite quadratic form mapping the finite abelian group to the rational numbers mod the integers, and given this finite abelian group, if you form this sum, you necessarily get e to the 2 pi over 8 times some integer r. And you're guaranteed to, and to have a lift to a lattice if you also specify n plus and n minus satisfying n plus minus n minus equals r. So all of the topological information that was present in that matrix K, we can actually forget about the matrix K. We can take a finite abelian group, a finite quadratic form Q, mapping that abelian group into the rationals mod the integers, and n plus and n minus. Okay, which tell us exactly how many right movers and left movers you have. And in fact, if you don't care about the edge, if you only care about the bulk, you can even more or less forget about the last step. Okay. So, so is this oh. more general than the matrix then? So this, this no, it does not give you anything you couldn't write down because this, this, if you know these, well, okay, so if you know these numbers as well, you automatically have a lift to a lattice. And therefore, that's equivalent to a K-matrix, since the K-matrix is a grand matrix for a lattice. On the other hand, what this does tell you is that, um, sorry, no, no. Yeah, actually, I, did, I gave an incorrect answer to your question. Your question is, is correct. Uh, it, your answer is, is right, that this is more general, OK? So there's necessarily a lift to a lattice, but that lift is not unique, even for fixed n plus and n minus, OK? 
So it turns out that there are distinct K matrices that can have all the same topological properties. They are distinguishable by edge properties, which I will put up on the, you know, the web page in extra reading if people want to read about that. Um, it's a long paper about that. But as far as the bulk properties are concerned, they're entirely determined by this. Okay? But in fact, that doesn't necessarily specify a unique K matrix. There can be more than one K matrix, even distinct, yeah, even. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, two different K yeah. Exactly. Yeah. For instance, yeah. Bulk topological phase. It uniquely describes a bulk topological phase, correct? Does not. Yes. So, um, so for instance, if you're given two K matrices, okay, and you want to know if the two K matrices are identical as matrices, that's actually not easy to determine because, um, Correct. Correct. Thank you. Right. Uh, I guess I erased it, but yes. So it's not easy to determine if two lattices are identical. I mean, you may say, look, if I have k and k prime and I want to know, are these equivalent? Well, then I actually have to find the w such that this is true, the change of basis. So if I have two lattices, I want to know if the lattices are identical. Well, I have to actually find the change of basis. To, to determine if they're identical, okay? That's actually not easy to do. On the other hand, the problem of determining whether the bulk topological properties are the same is actually simpler because all you have to do is find this finite abelian group D, which is lambda star mod lambda, the quadratic form, at which we can, of course, determine from, from K if we have a K matrix. And then, of course, you just have to compare the positive and negative eigenvalues. So in a sense, it's, it's a very limited set of invariants that determine the topological phase, whereas the lattices are, are not. So, yes? Yes. For a, fin for a finite abelian group, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, Well, I think you need to know n plus and n minus separately. I mean, because, because n plus plus n minus determines the rank of the matrix, the K matrix. OK, so again, if you, if you, care, if you, if you, if you care about, you know, since the K matrix encodes more properties than just what's known in the, bu the bulk topological phase encodes, so if you want it, such as edge properties, so if you want to know that full um, story, then you need to know n plus and n minus also. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and knowing n plus and n minus, yes. You can, and uh, oh yeah, so, so let me just repeat. If you know all these things, d, q, n plus and n minus, you can always find a lattice. There's always a lift to a lattice. Not unique. So there could be several distinct lattices that correspond to the same thing all of which have the same exact topolog bulk topological properties. Okay. Yes? When you say a list of lattices, that has less the integers of something that is not the same. Exactly. No. Yes? Um, yeah, no, they, um, they, there, are pro there are properties for, for fixed n plus, for even if you fix n plus and n minus, there are properties that are, that are um, stable to weak perturbations that are distinguishable, not that correspond to the same bulk. Or another way of saying it is there are phase transitions that can occur on the edge that leave the bulk unchanged, and the different phases on the edge can, can be stable. Yes. Well, R is only term mod 8, right? Because what you have on the right-hand side is, is this, yeah. R is only term mod 8, yeah. No. This is over and above the W. So 
w, of course, is just a change of basis in the lattice. So, so what I'm saying is that there actually are distinct lattices, okay? which is a little bit of digression that I'd be happy to put reading on the web page or discuss afterwards. But um, I just want to say, so I want to say one more thing about this, which is, um, so as I said, if you have two K matrices and you want to know if they're, if they're identical, you can, you're just supposed to find this group D. Uh, as it turns out, there's a, a nice way to do that. There's, for any such matrix, there's something called the Gauss-Smith normal form, OK? We can write the K matrix K as P M Q, where P and Q both have determinant one, plus or minus 1. And this matrix M is diagonal. Okay. So the matrix is, is diagonal. And the diagonal entries, of course, the determinant of K has to be the number of elements here. Those diagonal entries are the orders of a minimal cyclic decomposition of D. So D, the group, can be written as product over J of Z sub D. Oh, sorry, M, call this M, M, J, J. So there's an algorithm for taking any symmetric integer matrix K and writing it as a product of two unimodular matrices on the right and left, and a matrix M in the middle. And, I, and this, this algorithm is, is in various packages, too. So if you ever have to do this, you don't even have to do the hard work of finding these matrices. And then in between is a diagonal matrix with integer entries. And the integer entries in the diagonal matrix are a minimal cyclic decomposition. So you can always decompose this group D into a factor of, into a product of cyclic groups and um, so if you are trying to determine whether 2K matrices have the same bulk topological properties, the simplest way to do it is to go through this. First check that they have the same discriminant groups, which you can obtain in this way. And then once you have the discriminant groups, the quadratic form, you're just, it's a finite quadratic form. So you're now just evaluating a finite number of numbers here. Okay. And then you're doing a comparison. Yes. Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. Questions? Okay. So let's do a couple of examples then, briefly. So, So perhaps the simplest example is bosonic Laughlin state. OK, nu equals 1 half. Bosons at filling fraction, nu equals 1 half. The K matrix is a 1 by 1 matrix, which is just K equals 2. Okay. The lattice lambda is equal to square root of 2 times the integers. Okay, the basis vector, the one basis vector this lattice is just the number square root of 2. And since it's the grand matrix of the lattice, you multiply it by itself and you get k equals 2. The dual lattice is 1 over the square root of 2 times the integers. And the discriminant group is equal to z2. So we'll call the two elements here 0 and 1. The finite quadratic form here is q of 0 equals 0, and q of 1 
is equal to a quarter. The quarter is because, well, the half is, is just this thing squared. And remember, there's an explicit factor of 1 half here. And you can check that if I take, and, and, and so if I check, if I take 1 over, So using this, we can substitute these values into here. And you have 1 over the square root of 2 times 1 plus i, which is indeed equal to e to the 2 pi i over 8. Okay. So you can check that this holds. OK, so that's. Okay, bosonic law from the state. Now let's turn to fermionic law from the state, the one that actually occurs in nature, or at least in electron systems. U equals one third. So here k equals three. Okay. So the lattice lambda is equal to the square root of 3 times the integers. Lambda star is 1 over the square root of 3 times the integers. So the discriminant group is E3. Now if we take a look at our finite quadratic form, Q of 0 equals 0. Q of 1 is equal to 1 sixth. Q of 2 equals 2 thirds. Right. Now, um, some of you may anticipate that something's going to go wrong now. Okay. If I now try to form this, uh, this sum, this krauss milgram sum. I have 1 over the square root of 3 times 1 plus e to the pi i over 3. And then if I q of 2 is e to the 4 pi i over 3, which is minus e to the pi i over 3. And that's not equal to a pure phase. So something's actually gone wrong here. Okay. Okay, these two terms cancel out, and it looks the left hand side looks like one over square root of three. So something's gone wrong. Okay. Okay. Does anyone know what went wrong? What? No, it is a billion. Yes. Well, we're only supposed to ask what 0, 1, and 2 are. But you're right. The right a good question to ask is, is what's q of 3? And in fact, that looks kind of screwy, right? Because q of 3 has to be equal to q of 1. Now, what's gone wrong is, is that unfortunately, the world has fermions in it. Okay, And what you can see is what's differing here in these twist factors is these two particles are essentially differing by a fermion. Okay. And in fact, I wrote something down over here that's not quite right. 
in both in writing down. I hope I still have it up here, yeah. Both in writing down the T matrix and in writing down this Gauss-Milgram sum, I wrote over here V squared over 2, okay? And over here there's an e to the pi i V squared. Now, these are supposed to only depend on the equivalence class, V not on the actual vector V. And under a shift, under a shift of V by um, an integer, uh, by a, a, a lattice vector, V squared shifts by integers. Okay, but that could actually introduce a minus sign over here in principle. And actually over here, there's an ambiguity of minus sign because you can see this one half here is actually a square root. So actually, the equations that we wrote down don't quite hold for arbitrary K matrices, okay? In fact, or arbitrary lattices. As written, they really only hold for an even K matrix or even lattice or even integral lattice means that all length squareds in the lattice are even integers, not just integers. Or another way of saying it is that all diagonal elements KII are even. Okay, That's an even matrix or an even integral lattice. That occurs in bosonic systems, okay, or a system in which there's no fermions among the degrees of freedom that are being um, that are part of the theory, okay, then these are all even numbers. Then these twists are all perfectly well defined, okay, because these, in, these, these squares have to be even numbers, shifting it shifts by an even number. This is well defined because this is an even number. And so everything goes through well defined so long as the K matrix of the lattice is even, okay. In the case that it's odd, okay, most of what I said is still true, it's just that certain properties. Are not, very, are not completely well-defined, because this has an ambiguity. And the ambiguity is physical, which is that twist factors aren't, in a system that has, let's say, fermions like electrons that are, base, that are fundamental particles in the theory, well, the twist factor for a particle is a little bit um, ambiguous. You can always then take an electron, add it to your particle, and you've changed its twist factor by minus one without changing any other topological properties. So the, topologic, so the, top, the twists are not completely well-defined. The T matrix or Dane twists are not completely well defined. And really, you're living in a world where only S and T squared are well defined. Okay. So, most of what I said goes through, except for this part over here with the Gauss Milgram sum. You have to be a little more careful because it's only S and T squared that are completely well defined. Okay. And that shows up over here as soon as we even consider the Laughlin state. Okay. Can you modify that to make it work? So the question is, can you modify that to make it work? Um, yeah, so that would be a substantial digression. The answer is yes. You can modify it to make it work. There, are, there is... To every fermionic theory, there are bosonic theories that, uh, that, that, that um, um, you can think of as modified versions of the fermionic theory, but they won't have the same central charge. You have to take advantage of the fact that you can, you can, you can change these numbers. Okay. Uh, and this was explained originally in paper by... Belloff and Moore from, I think, 2005-ish or thereabouts. Okay. Although not, not exactly in that language that I just used, so I'll put some, some reading up on the web about that. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Oh, well, we have the K-matrix in hand, 
So the K matrix tells us what the inner product is on vectors. Okay, and this is just what you get. So you you take you take you there's a there's an inner product on 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 the dual lattice, okay, which descends to this finite form over here. Okay, when we take when we take the coset. So I just want to then, very briefly, for write down that there are K matrices for quantum Hall states. So, for instance, there's the high, so I wrote down the Laughlin state. There's the what are called the hierarchy states with. Or Haldane Halper and hierarchy states whose filling fraction is continued fraction. Of this form and this has a I'm just going to write it down without much explanation just to give you a sense of the flavor of what these K matrices are like this has corresponds to the K matrix so it's a tridiagonal matrix um, I think actually with plus signs here I think it's minus signs here okay so everything else is zero okay so these kinds so this this theory Although I've only shown you explicitly the Laughlin states and, and the Torah code, um, this theory also includes the, the higher, the, these states in the quantum Hall effect. There's the it's usually called the Jane sequence of states, which is nu equals n over 2 pm. Well, plus or minus one. Um, I'll just write down the plus one case, and this is a K matrix with two P plus ones on the diagonal and two P's everywhere else. Uh, I guess I wrote the two P, yeah, uh, yeah. And this is an N by N K matrix, right? So this is a very flexible formalism that includes all, basically all of the well-known uh, abelian quantum Hall states, like the Laughlin states and the Torah, sorry, abelian topological states, the Laughlin states, Torah code, um, hierarchy, and so on and so forth. Um, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, so th this is a so it's a particular sequence that I I believe is experimentally a particularly strong sequence of states and experiments with filling fraction n over two pm plus one. You can think of it in the quote unquote composite fermion language as um, n fi n filled Landau levels of composite fermions, where each composite fermion is made by attaching 2p flux to the electrons. Okay, so that's that, that's sort of what the that's a way of interpreting the structure inside this K matrix, where you think of like the n columns and rows as being like n Landau levels, and 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 all these 2p's are sort of attaching flux. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's not here. The particle hole conjugates states also exist, and they have K matrices, but I'm not going to write them down right now.
Yeah, so I, I, I did not mean to imply that these are the only ones for which we have for K matrices. Yeah. Yes. Um, sorry, I, I, could you ask the question again? I didn't quite get what the question was. Ah, I'm not classifying. I'm, I'm showing you what the effective here, you mean, or just in general? Yeah, in general. What I was showing you is the physics of abelian, of, of um, I guess I've erased it, of multi component abelian Chern Simons theory. I was showing you what the topological properties of that theory are. Okay? But, as I, I think you were kind of pointing out, you can turn that into a classification of abelian topological phases because abelian topological phases are, by, by, by nature, those for which the set of particle types forms an abelian group. They necessarily have topological twist factors, Q. From those topological twist factors, you can actually also determine the R matrices and F matrices, although I'm not going to do that right now, but you kind of, I think, maybe got the gist when I wrote down the S matrix. Okay? And so you can actually get all the topological properties out of just the properties that are written over here. To which multiple K matrices correspond. Yeah. So if you wish, this board over here is classification of ab abelian topological phases. Sorry, char sorry, characterizations. No, no, that's a much better way of saying it. It's a characterization. Yeah. Mm. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, this terminates at some point, at some PN, and this terminate and this terminally terminates somewhere over over here too. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right. It's a characterization. To turn this into a classification, we then need to use the fact that, that we, know, we know the classification of all finite abelian groups, and they can all be written down in, as a product of powers of cyclic groups of prime power order, and then you would, of course, also have to classify all the possible finite quadratic forms on those, which it turns out can also be decomposed into quadratic forms on each of those prime, fact, prime powers that are sitting inside of D. So, it really is a characterization, but this could be pushed into a classification. Yes? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that, th that and other constructions always end up giving you data like this. Yeah. Yes? Well, in these theories, um, it's because we have a. Oh, yeah, sorry. So the question was why do we always have a finite number of super selection sectors? Um, in general, that's an assumption that goes into the definition of a topological phase that you have a finite number of particle types. Okay? In this particular case of a K matrix, that's, that's a necessary feature just because the discriminant group is finite order, has a finite number of elements. No, there might be. I'm just saying this, the, the structure of the theory that, I'm describe it, that I've described with the definitions that I've described don't describe theories of the infinite number of particle types. That isn't to say that you couldn't find some physical system where that's necessary. I mean, it doesn't seem like the most natural thing, but it, you know, it certainly is a possibility. What's that? Uh, okay, I guess we're done then. Yeah. <laughs> Deter uh, like specify n plus and minus. The lifting is still.